Turning now to the city of Goma in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, which is nearly surrounded by rebels from the M23 group, which is fighting against the government's forces. Now, despite the presence of UN peacekeepers in the city, residents are worried for their safety. This is a part of the country that has suffered years of militant attacks, and the desperate civilians are crying out in fear and frustration. Almost every day, people take to the streets in eastern Congo's Goma. They're fed up with increasing attacks by militants, especially M23 rebels. They say UN peacekeepers and troops deployed from East Africa are failing to protect them, and they are tired of waiting for aid from their own government. We're going hungry. The sick are dying because we can't even find porridge to feed them. We are not leaving empty-handed. We know there's food in a depot, so give it to us. The UN says over 800,000 people have been displaced by fighting between Congolese forces and M23 rebels. The collapse of yet another ceasefire in early March has aggravated the situation. Thousands of displaced live in Kanyaruchinya, north of Goma. Local authorities say protesters here attacked a passing UN convoy, which then fired into a crowd, killing eight civilians and wounding 28 more. We would like the bodies released from the morgue so that we can grieve. And maybe there will be less tension. This family is mourning the loss of Samuel Mahaga. The 22-year-old was one of those shot dead by UN peacekeepers. He helped us all like a father. I'm a widow, and he took care of me and the whole family. Resentment is rife towards MONUSCO, the UN mission in Congo. MONUSCO is the UN's largest and most expensive mission in the world, yet many here say it doesn't make them safer. There have been many deaths, and the more deaths there are, the more soldiers there are. They keep coming, and there's still no solution. The war continues. Monusco is due to pull out of the DRC next year, but many want them to leave sooner. If that sentiment grows, the Monusco head worries the situation could become even worse. If we don't act urgently to try and reduce these tensions, we risk finding ourselves in an even more complex situation than the one in which we find ourselves in at the moment. Efforts are underway. A United Nations Security Council delegation visited Goma recently to discuss solutions to the conflict. The EU pledged 47 million euros in aid, and a First Mercy flight delivered tents and medical supplies. But many families like this one wonder, will it be enough? Our next guest has studied and written on protests in Africa. Zakaria Mampali is a professor of political science at the City, of, uh, City University of New York. Welcome to DW News Africa, Zakaria. Uh, now, looking at the DRC, Kenya, Tunisia, Nigeria, South Africa, right across the continent, we've seen people rising up in discontent. Do you see any common elements between these protests? Very much. This has been an ongoing phenomenon for over a decade now. And what they share, I mean, obviously, there are many different immediate triggers for these protests. But what they share is a, a general disillusionment with the state of governance in these countries, in particular, the forms of electoral democracy that have been adopted. Uh, and a sense of disconnect between the ordinary people uh, and the governments that are in power uh, across Africa. Right. Um, why, why, when they're discontent, why, why do they seem to turn to this form of action? What makes protest more appealing for them? I think a big part of it is a sense that there isn't much of a difference between the choices that are being put on offer and a general distrust uh, of the overall electoral processes that we're seeing. I mean, as we saw most recently in Nigeria, you know, elections are meant to be opportunities for ordinary people to voice their opinions on the political system. 
uh, but there's a general cynicism around whether or not elections are actually serving that function in many African democracies today. Uh, and I think that they are rightly uh, justified uh, in their distrust of the prevailing systems. But as you mentioned, there's this political element, but uh, uh, in what cases do we see more sort of organic uprisings? Well, I think what many of these protests share in common is that they usually start over around uh, everyday livelihood issues. So if we look at what's been happening in Kenya, the immediate trigger for these protests were spikes in prices. And we've seen inflation uh, taking quite a hit on African households uh, over the past few years in particular. So I think, um, you know, they often are starting by sort of very basic questions around the cost of uh, food in particular. Uh, but they can quickly morph into larger questions around the nature of government and, and whether or not governments are actually doing the things that we expect governments to do uh, in terms of maintaining the welfare of the population. Uh, we've seen uh, this form of um, action take place not just in Africa but around the world. We're seeing more and more of these kinds of mass up, uh, uprisings, uh, and particularly because we're in this instant age of social media and other forms of of uh, direct media, uh, do we see some kind of inspiration that protest movements get from each other? Well, I think there's two things going on, right? One is, of course, these larger structural forces like inflation uh, that has really wreaked havoc across many African economies. Um, and certainly we're seeing protesters learning not only from other countries, but also from their own histories. I mean, many of these countries are not in their first bout of mass protests, but their second or third uh, since the 2010s. And so uh, as these things, you know, as these forces are, are continue to wreak havoc uh, for African households, uh, I think we'll continue to see more protests going forward and, and, and newer and more sophisticated forms of protest as well. And is it mere just anger being put out or are they, you know, calling for specific goals and, 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 and are they effective in, in, in achieving these? I think anger, of course, is always a, a hugely motivating force, uh, but I think it's it's also a form of hope, right? They are they are actually trying actively uh, through a democratic right to bring change uh, through voicing their their opinions on the streets rather than through the ballot box. And I think that's not uh, surprising when there's a sense that the systems that are in place are, are no longer working. Um, do they bring change? I mean, definitely, we've seen many, many cases uh, where these protests have been quite effective, whether we're talking about things that have happened recently in places like Sudan um, or in Nigeria earlier. Uh, we know that governments are forced to respond, and hopefully governments will use democratic means to respond to the protests rather than cracking down on them, as we've seen in too many African countries. Uh, do we see, I mean, sometimes the, these protests can also create a, uh, a situation where they pave the way uh, for, for example, uh, instability, like oh, the, the military seizing power, like we saw in Guinea or in Mali, for example. Does, does this pose a threat to the democracy itself? I think the threat from the democracy doesn't come from the protesters, but I do think that, you know, the, the larger... Uh, specter of instability is a, is a real one and does produce dynamics which can be um, co-opted by more nefarious political forces that could turn these countries, you know, towards uh, coup d'etats, as we've seen in a number of different countries, uh, ethnic clashes, as we've seen in other places. So, you know, I, I, I do think this is a very fraught moment uh, for these governments in terms of how they respond to the protesters. But I have not seen a situation where, you know, governments uh, falling towards repression uh, is the solution. So I think we all should be very concerned uh, about how African governments, the Kenyan government, uh, the Congolese government and others are, are choosing to respond to these protesters, which again uh, are being conducted by their own young people. And uh, I think are, is something that we should, we should always keep at the, at the forefront of our mind. These are not the actions of, of you know, outside terrorist organizations. They are their own citizens. Uh, and as, a, as such, there should be a different kind of response available. Okay. Zakaria Mampali, Professor of Political Science in New York, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for having me.